Um, so I want to um, tell you all how much I appreciate your support, your continued support. So today we're gathering to hear um, presentations from our legal services, our um, ASO, EEOC update, our lobbyists, and um, our attorney, Mr. Greenberg, is going to talk about the ferments and, and, and how we stop the layoffs. So some of you might feel like none of this information, the retirees might feel like it might not affect them and the active might not feel like it might not affect you, but it affects us all in some kind of way. The only thing that might not affect the retirees, of course, is anything pertaining to the pension. But everything else that we're going to talk about tonight is going to affect all of you, all of you at some, at, at, in some way, shape, or form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, so we can start, Charlene, Tanja? Yes. You don't see the guest speaker? No. Okay, so um, Harry, could you um, speak? I'm going to introduce our attorney, Mr. Harry Greenberg, um, and he's going to talk about the deferments and how we stop um, the layoffs. All right, Trina, let's, the meeting starts at 432. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so the city is in dire need of funds. And they were looking for $1 billion from all of the unions to stay to stop layoffs or demotions. This is as loud as I can get. So I'll try to talk slow and as loud as I can get. So some of the unions, like the teachers, deferred, for, deferred not gave up, deferred $450 million of money that is due the members. The DC 37 deferred $160 million, and there are other unions doing the same thing. Nobody wants, and this is only good till June 30th, 2021. The city has contacted the UPOA, and in order to make sure none of us are demoted or laid off once we are demoted. What we did is not to affect anybody's pockets. What we did is defer what we're doing, actually. We haven't signed a document yet. What the deferred payment of the annuity, which started May 28, 2019, until June, uh, uh, I'm sorry, until December of 2021, when we will get all the money retroactive. There will be no loss of money. And in addition, because we have reserves, both in the active and retirees, you will see no effect. You will continue to be paid for all your claims, just as you have been for the next uh, 10 months. And then all of the money that's owed us will be paid by the city on December 31st, 2021. We're reviewing the language of the MOA. Nobody's going to lose anything. Nobody's going to be demoted for budgetary reasons. And nobody's going to be laid off. So this is a good, unfortunately, the city's broke basically because of the pandemic, right? But for other reasons also. So in order to make sure your lives are not um, changed in any way, your salaries will continue, all your other benefits will continue. You will see no effect at all. And the monies that are owed us will be paid on December 31, 2021. That's, so that's the deferment and there's no layoffs. On, you're protected until June 30th, 2021 and no demotion for budgetary reasons. Okay. That's it. So you all understand that. So the so the, so you you heard Mr. Green, Mr. Greenberg. Any questions you can put it in the chat and we could refer it to him at a later date. But we want to move on with the agenda. Next on the agenda is the legal services. All right, they said he couldn't hear. What happened was some people say he couldn't hear you, Harry. So jump in if I'm if I'm wrong. Mr. Greenberg was telling us that. that Mr. Greenberg was telling us that, that as you all know, there was um, 22,000, over 22,000 city employees jobs at risk. So what other unions did to not, so that anyone wouldn't lose their jobs was 
they did deferments. And what UPOA is gonna do the same thing, we're gonna defer. And what we're gonna defer is our, um, we was due to get the annuity monies. So what we're gonna do is defer that monies until from, it was due to, uh, it, it goes back from May, 2019, but we're gonna not, we, we're not gonna take it now. We're gonna wait until December, right Harry, until December, 2021. And that puts us in a good place. The good thing is UPOA has enough reserves that we can we can take care and pay all the bills without any interference or anybody. So on a good note is that nobody loses their jobs and it doesn't affect our benefits in no kind of way. Correct? That's correct. And that's correct. So that's that's the good thing. So I wanted to get that out the way. So today, jobs are secure. No one's going to get demoted. And I want the retirees on board to, to know that your benefits, not, not, your benefits will continue to be paid out as, as planned, all right? Nothing, we will not skip a beat. Financially, UPOA is in a very, very good place, okay? So the next up is um, Seth Greenberg and, and, and Sandy Barone. They're gonna talk about the legal services. Some of these things, you, the, the active has already heard, but I want you to hear it again. And there's some things that we did not, and there was, there's a new added legal service that we did not talk about, which is the, um, which is the um, Medicaid planning. And that's for everybody, for active and, and um, retired. So um, without further ado, I'm going to have, and they're sharing the screen now, I'm gonna have Seth and Sandy do their presentation about the legal services that we have and the added service. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me loud and clear. My name is Seth Greenberg. and I'm a partner at the Law Offices of Greenberg, Berza Kelly Greenberg. I want to thank your executive board and your welfare fund trustees for inviting us to today's meeting. As you, as some of you may already be aware, a little over a year ago, the fund started providing active and retired UPOA members with certain legal service benefits free of charge to the members. Three of those primary services are estate planning, estate administration, and real estate services. I want to briefly go over what those services are and how you can get access to them. And then I'm gonna hand things over to Sandy Barone. Uh, I'll give her introduction, who's gonna speak about uh, one of the newer benefits that is covered completely free to the member with regards to uh, Medicaid planning. And so I want, um, I know that um, UPOA President Powell and the trustees wanted us to present this, to get the message out there. We know this is a challenging time filled with a lot of uncertainty. Our hope is that these services make things a little bit easier for you and your family. And so what you have on the screen um, is our presentation today. What you see uh, on the screen now are the estate planning documents that is available to the members free of charge, simple and complex wills, powers of attorney, healthcare proxies, living wills, trust, and Medicaid planning, which we'll be talking about shortly. There's also the state administration services that are available at no charge and at reduced rates for those things that are outside of the plan. I'm gonna go on to the third which is real estate, the purchase, sale, and refinance of a primary or secondary home, not for investment purposes um, and not outside the contiguous counties of New York City, um, but all of that is covered as long as it fits within that um, jurisdiction. And the deed transfers are covered as well. And again, we, we extend reduced rates for family members. Now, how do you use the plan in all services? Very simple, you call 516-570-4343. Monday through Friday, other than weekends and holidays, right? 9 a.m. to, I'm sorry, 5 p.m. Um, we get often calls come in. Someone should be here closer to 536, but it's, that's a typo, it should be 5 p.m. We do have two office locations, one by LIJ Hospital on the border of Queens and Nassau, the other in Manhattan. You can also set up, um, video, audio, video conferencing capabilities, and there's a process. You're looking for our estate planning services, you call up, you'll get a questionnaire to fill out, and that'll start the process of 
an attorney reaching out to you to set up a consultation and to prepare the documents. I'm gonna, one of the newer plan benefits, Medicaid planning, is uh, something that a number of the members have been asking about. And so the trustees expanded the program to include that at no cost to you. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Sandy in just a moment, but I just want to introduce you to Sandy. Sandy's a lawyer with our firm, and she takes the lead in the estate planning and real estate matters. She is a graduate of CUNY Law School, has a Master's of Law in uh, Taxation from Temple University, where she also obtained a certificate in estate planning. She's been doing this for a while, knows what she's doing. Anybody that has had experience with her knows her well. Um, and um, I'm going to hand things over now. I'm going to mute myself and hand things over to Sandy, who's then going to give you a brief introduction to Medicaid planning. Um, any questions, of course, you can always call the office. Someone will get back to you after we verify that you are a member and get the services. Um, and with that, Sandy. <laughs> okay, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. I okay, could. good. <laughs> I was on the Sandy, yeah. I just got I just got in the chat that they love you. Oh great, great. I'm <laughs> glad. I love them all too, believe me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we build a, a lot of relationships, really good relationships. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about uh, the, the previous um the previous Zoom meeting we had, I talked about estate planning, basic estate planning. So now I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Medicaid planning. Now, Medicaid is very complicated, so I don't want to confuse anyone here. So I try to make I try to make it as simple as possible. So this is just a basic, basic, basic you know, introduction. That's it. So why do why do we need to plan ahead with Medicaid? Okay, so let's talk about Medicaid. Medicaid is a federal program. It provides health coverage to certain people if they're eligible. So the state, the states partners with the federal government to implement the program. But there's certain federal standards that they have to abide by. So Medicaid is means tested. You must be eligible with respect to assets and income. So what does it mean to you? It simply put, you, you must be broke and you must be sick for you to be eligible for Medicaid. So this Medicaid planning is all about helping you to become, in quotes, broke for Medicaid purposes. So why would you need Medicaid? <clears throat> Medicaid is the only healthcare coverage program that provides long-term care. You can purchase a long-term care policy, but it's pretty, ex it can get pretty expensive. You can pay probably up to 3000 4000 per year for long-term coverage. And it gets more expensive, obviously, as you get older. And the premium goes up every year. So it can get very expensive. And the services provided by the long-term care health insurance is also limited. <clears throat> so, um, so that's why it's very important to plan for Medicaid. In case, and let me just say this now, because we're just talking about Looking down the road, if you, suffer, if you suffer from an illness and you need nursing home care. So we are focusing on nursing home care only, not home care or anything else, but just specifically skilled nursing home care. If you have to go there and you have to you have a long-term stay, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're gonna focus on uh, tonight. So <clears throat> like, I, like I said, if you have a chronic illness like Alzheimer's and you need to go to a skilled nursing home, and you don't have Medicaid or a long-term care policy, your, insurance, your own health insurance is not gonna cover the cost. So you, what do you have to do? You have to pay out of pocket for it. Nursing home costs in New York per year, okay, so let's go. Approximately 100 to $140,000. This is according to New York State Department of Financial Services. So it's very, very expensive. So if you have, if you don't have Medicaid, if you don't have a long-term care policy and you have $100,000 in the bank, Guess what? All of that is going to go towards your uh, to pay the cost of a skilled nursing home. So let's 
talk a little bit about the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is not Medicaid. Medicare, Medicare provides people age 65 years or older with health insurance. When you, when you, when you be 65, you become eligible to enroll in Medicare. And you know, there's some requirements, which is you, if you're a legal resident for five years, for at least five years. So Medicaid, Medicare will pay for limited stays and rehab facilities or nursing home. For example, if you have a hip replacement and you need inpatient physical therapy for several weeks, or if you become so sick that you have to stay at an assisted living facility or nursing home, they won't pay more than 100 days. After that, you're on your own. So basic, so Medicare is not Medicaid. Again, Medicaid is the only one to pay for long term care. So uh, next slide. So what does Medicaid mean to US UPOA members? So what happens if you need nursing home care down the road? Will you be Medicaid? That's the question you should ask yourself. Will you be Medicaid eligible? Or will you have to pay out of pocket? You also have to ask yourself if you want your access to go to your loved ones or to pay for your long-term care if you're chronically ill. Medicaid will only help you after most of your assets are spent down. That means you have to use up all of those assets to pay for Medicaid and then Medicaid will step in to cover the costs. So for example, with Medicaid, we'll let you keep 50 down to 750 as of 2020 of your assets. So if you have 100,000 in assets, you're not gonna be qualified for Medicaid until you spend it down and you get to $17,750. If you're single, if you're married is, um, and both spouses are applying, then it increases to about 23,100. And if one spouse is applying and the, uh, the, the other spouse as well and staying home, then the spouse gets to, to, to keep $128,640 exactly as of 2020. And you also must meet the income qualification. So there's asset qualification and there's income qualification. So the income for a single person is 875. If you make more than that, you're not going to be qualified for Medicaid. If one spouse is applying, the, 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 the wealth spouse gets to keep $1,284. So how can you protect your assets and still be eligible for Medicaid? You have to plan ahead. I can't say that enough. You have to plan ahead. Medicaid has a five-year look-back period to, when they determine if you're eligible. That means they look back five years from the time you apply to see if you have gifted or transferred any of your assets, and then they'll pull those assets back in and they'll count it as and they'll count those assets. For example, you're single and you have less than fifteen thousand seven hundred fifty in assets and you need nursing home care. But three years ago, you gave your child fifty thousand dollars as a gift. So you see, but for that fifty thousand that you gave as a gift three years back will not be eligible. So they go back five years to look for anything that you transferred. So you have to plan ahead, at least five years. Hello. So the big picture, in elder law, elder law is basically is the area of law that specializes on the uh, issues of the aging population. We typically deal with two types of trust, revocable and irrevocable. So the revocable trust, say this is your chest. This is, you know, this is Katrina's chest full of money. Any assets she can put in it. Any assets that come in, they can come out. You have complete control of it. This chest is never locked, so to speak. You own it by outright and you can do whatever you want. If you want to take it out, you can take it out. But remember, if you can get your hands on it, so can Medicaid. And if Medicaid can get their hands on it, then of course, they're going to count it as your assets. So, okay. So why do we need re revocable trust? It's, it's not good for estate planning, and, and it's not. Because remember, that trust is never locked. So the reason why we use it, we use this revocable trust with irrevocable trust. So it's easy, revocable trusts are easy to manage if you become sick and you, you have to, you, de you designate someone to take over the management of the trust. 
there's no probate probate involved. You avoid the time and expense of probate. And there's privacy because there's no probate. Your trust remains private, unlike a will, which is basically public record. So that's that's the reason why we that's the reason why we do revocable trusts. Now, irrevocable trusts. Can put certain assets, but only certain individuals can move them. But it's never you, the grantor, which is the person that creates trust. So you, when you create an irrevocable trust, you can't, you have no control of the trust. You can't touch it. You have, you pick one by person that you trust, and they are the trustee. So the assets are basically locked up from you. But the trust itself creates, you create your own instructions in the trust as to what happens to those assets should something happen to you, so you pass away. So if you have certain beneficiaries that you want to give to, so you name them as beneficiaries in the trust. But you can, but you, you can, you can go in there and, and, and give directions as to what you want to do. Because after the trust, after you hand it over to the trustee, the, trust, the trustee has control basically. There are ways of you getting income and assets from the trust that that won't that won't hurt your ability to get Medicaid. So that's the purpose of irrevocable trust. You can get money out, but not regular way like an like a regular revocable trust. So that's why we create irrevocable trust to help out with Medicaid planning. Okay, so I just, I was talking about it, okay. Can you go back a second, Seth? Okay. So again, to protect your assets so they will not be counted for Medicaid purposes, okay? You can, you talk, we talk about the trustee. Basically, you put the chest, you let, you, you close the, you, you put the, the, your assets in the trust, you close the lid, and then you give the key to your trustee, someone who you really trust. And you can not open the chest, only the trustee has the key. Okay, so if you can have, if you don't have access to to this to this chest, neither can Medicaid. But that's why this works for purposes of Medicaid. So you are the creator of your irrevocable trust. You leave instructions for your trustee to follow. So remember that you leave instruction. It's not something that you're giving away your money to some to your trustee. But you you leave your instructions as to what you want to, to be done with the money. So um, for purposes of Medicaid, Medicaid has certain assets that they will count to determine your eligibility for Medicaid. And these are all a list. This is a list of all of the, um, probably more, but these are just the, the easy ones. The check in the savings, the brokerage, all of these, the, your, your residence, there's an 893 um, exemption. So if you have a house, less than 893,000 in New York, your house is exempt for purposes of Medicaid. Um, okay, so excluded assets. Your primary address, your house is exempt if, like I said, if it's less than 893,000 and, and the applicant intends to return home. One vehicle you're allowed, you're allowed an insurance policy with no cash value, or if it's less than $1,500 in equity. You have, um, you can buy burial contracts, $1,500 for burial uh, uh, contract, for burial contract, and you have, um, yeah, it's not much, that, it's not really much that's, that's excluded. So basically, if you go back to the, the previous slide, those, everything basically is, is included when they're, when they're checking for um, eligibility for Medicaid. The takeaway on this is proactive versus crisis planning. Crisis planning is you wait until something happens and you scramble to get something going. So this is where Medicaid doesn't take all of your assets. If you need nursing home care and you haven't done any planning, then whatever is in your bank, whatever is stocks or bonds that you have, is gonna disqualify you. And you're gonna to have to pay a pen, they call it a penalty period. You're gonna have, you're gonna be penalized and for a for certain amount of period that you're penalized for, you're not gonna get any Medicaid help. So it's very important to not wait until something happens to you 
before you um, before you try to get Medicaid. So what we want to do is proactive planning. That's the whole idea behind the, trust, the irrevocable trust. So you want to do pro proactive planning, and you want to do it five years ahead. Or like if you're per if you're perfectly healthy, you don't you know, and you're 40 years old, obviously, you're not going to need, you're not going to need to do Medicaid. But if you're going into your 60s and you, you, you have, you, you know, you have some health conditions and you think you're going to need long-term care, that's the time I would say to start planning for, um, to start doing some Medicaid planning. You can call it family protection planning. You know, you want your money to go to your, your heirs. You don't want to pay for, you don't want it to go to Medicaid to pay for long-term costs. So, um, who's that? Hello? 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 Okay, so can, am I on again? Okay. So, these are some websites that if you want to take a picture of or um, copy, the very, um, you know, they have a lot of information regarding Medicaid and, you know, what you need to do to become eligible. The law is always changing, so um, try, we try to keep up to date on that. Um, and that's it. If you guys have any questions, you need to call, let me know. Uh, I can help you. So, so we're going to, at the request of the union, we're going to make, um, you know, we continually put... Um, a page of contact information and a general review or summary of our services in your newsletter. We'll continue to do that. We'll provide some of this information, access the information uh, to the union to either put out on their website or again in their newsletter. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to call. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, uh, executive board and trustees for allowing us the opportunity. I'm going to stop my share now and hand things back over to Katrina. So, thank you. You're on mute. I'm looking at it. How does my state board? I think the uh, yeah. president's on mute still. So. Uh, hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. It's yes. Katrina. Tilt this one. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, so what I wanted to say is that thank you, Jeff and Sandy, for the presentation. And Seth, um, uh, um, we want to know, I got questions whether the um slide, the presentation, the PowerPoint will be available to us, which I believe is good so for your review. So without further ado, when I first became the president, I wanted to make sure that I went around and I've been talking to people about the work that we do as probation officers throughout the city. And a lot of them, was, a lot of uh, city officials was very surprised at what we do. They apparently did not have a clear That's understanding of what probation is. And we wear a lot of different hats. So we have had, we've been, um, we've had um, Letitia James come to our, somebody needs to mute their phone. Uh, we have had Letitia James come to our event back in 2018, Latrice Walker. We've had um, Danique Miller come to the Bronx and to Queens and talk to the members. And so tonight we have a, a speaker, a, a guest speaker, uh, I want to, um, say thank you to Mr. Eric, the Borough President Eric Adams for um, coming to speak to you all. Um, Mr. Adams was one of the first city officials to, along with Governor Como to acknowledge, acknowledge us for the first time as first responders. Um, it's unfortunate during the pandemic is, at the time is when we was finally acknowledged as first responders. We wanna thank you Mr. Adams for, for acknowledging us as first responders. And because of you, we can just go to the front of the line at Costco's and BJ's when I have to <laughs> all right. And we add Applebee's and get discounts in various <laughs> restaurants, which we can still do. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you all Borough President um, Eric Adams. We want to thank you so much. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. And, you know, your entire team and uh, just the leadership uh, that's coming from those who were on the front line uh, throughout this entire pandemic. And as we cycle into uh, what looks like an increase in the number of COVID cases. And we were on the front line together. I remember uh, delivering PPEs uh, to your team. Uh, I remember placing a mattress on the floor of Borough Hall and sleeping there for four months and looking out the window at 345 and 
seeing your teams going in and out of the building uh, because you were there and people forgot that. Um, when COVID hit this city, uh, some of us uh, did not leave. We stayed here and we continued to provide the service. I think that we divided the city up into uh, those who could shelter in place, social distance and be at home with their families. And then you had a large number of us, including uh, your membership uh, that you couldn't do that. And we were exposed to the threat of COVID-19 uh, long before the science was clear. And when I was giving you face mask and giving uh, TA uh, employees face mask and NYCHA residents face mask, we had people in Washington, D Washington DC saying, don't wear face mask. Mm -hmm. Folks wanna rewrite the history now, uh, but in reality, uh, we were there and really doing what needed to needed to be done. And so I want to just touch on a few points. Uh, you know, one of my favorite people is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He has a, a saying that I live by. We spend a lifetime pulling people out of the river. No one goes upstream and prevent them from falling in in the first place. Your job is because of the failures of preventing people from falling in the river of crime, the river of believing that they don't have a place in this society. And is it because of that, you are downstream uh, catching people who were not only, I believe, fell into the river, but they were pushed in. Now I know this story all, all too well. For those of you who don't know me, I grew up in South Jamaica, Queens, born in Brooklyn and grew up in South Jamaica, Queens. And it was not always easy. In fact, it was hard. I talk about in my introductory video how uh, my siblings and I uh, would go uh, to school every day with a garbage bag full of clothing, uh, afraid that when we got home, the marshals would have thrown us out. And my mother did not want us to be embarrassed. So she would give us enough change of clothing for the week. But my story is no different than the stories of so many people. It is a city that for the most part, not only here in New York, but across America that we abandon people. And I think our cities are dysfunctional in that we create our own crises. And one agency in the city creates a crisis, another agency responds to that crisis. And we put people on the front line to deal with the crises that were created. And at the heart of the crises I'm talking about, uh, although there are many agencies that are doing the same things, but the Department of Education. The Department of Ed Education feeds your crisis that you see every day. If you just look at the other end of the river, the, the Rikers Island, 55% of people on Rikers Island have a learning disability. 30 to 40% are dyslexic. A third of the 18 to 21 year olds read below a fifth grade reading level. And then if you ask the question, if we would have done the right job while our young people were in school, we would not be experiencing those who are in jail for dyslexia because they couldn't read, but they would have had an opportunity to believe in themselves and not believe that they can't learn, but just the opposite. If we would have identified learning disabilities early, children won't sit on Rikers Island because they feel as though the only pathway to having a decent life is crime. But as long as we continue to do these things that are downstream response instead of upstream, we're going to continue to see the problems that we have. Just take this one example for a moment. We know every year, six to 700 young people are going to age out of foster care. Every year, we know this. Yet, we also know that only 12% of them will graduate from high school. Only 3% will enroll in college. They are going to have the highest level of mental health illnesses, highest level of eviction, highest level of being the victims of crime or participating in crime. If we just take $50 million and invest in those children through programs like Fair Future, and allow them instead of aging out at 21 to age out at 26, 90% graduate from high school. 
a substantial number enroll in college. They have life coaches throughout their time until they're 26 and they have a more stable environment. What I am saying in essence, in order for our city to move forward and to decrease the load of always having to use handcuffs instead of giving someone a hand to step up, instead of creating environments where we respond to crises, but we prevent crisis, this city will have resources to do better things. Our tax dollars are wasted. We're doing our job, paying our taxes on time and sometimes too high. But the reality is our tax dollars are not being used appropriately to run a 21st century city. And the real challenges we face, as I conclude, is the future. There's a study that Oxford University put out. It stated in the next 20 years, 40% of the jobs we are preparing our children for today won't be available. And it's more than just self-driving cars. It is also looking at things like the stock market and those who are brokers at the height of the Wall Street trading room floor. We have 5,000 people on the trading room floor. We're now down to 500 because of artificial intelligence and computer learning. Artificial intelligence and computer learning is going to change how we run cities yet we're not preparing our children and our young people for the jobs of the future. We're creating a permanent underclass that's going to be relegated to a position of being outside the possibilities of being a middle-class city. So it's time to have our city catch up to the future and not be left behind and not leave people behind in the process. I'm encouraged to do so. I need partners like you as we move our city in the right direction. This is an exciting moment for us as we cycle into the new leadership in 2021. I am and will continue to be who you are. I tell people all the time as I'm on this journey, I am just a blue collar worker that's using government to do right by those middle class and blue collar people that have sustained this city. Every successful council, a white shoe law firm person, his mom or dad was a blue collar worker. Every surgeon that is making hundreds of thousands of dollars, his mom or dad was a blue collar worker. As my son move into professional life, I tell him never forget the fact, you're stepping on the skill set and dedication that blue collar men and women in the city made for the city of New York. This is a blue collar town and it's time to have blue collar leaderships. Those of us who have gone through a lot know how to help people who are going through a lot. And you are really personifies that, you and your membership. So again, I thank you for allowing me to come on and spend some time with you. I look forward to continue to be your partner in the future. Thank you so much, Mr. Adams. Thank you so much. We really appreciate thank you. It. And God bless you and have a happy holiday. And hopefully 2021 will be a better year for us all. And be safe. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Thank you, Dominique. Okay, um, so we're going to move on with our agenda. And from time to time, we'll have other, what I plan on doing, like I did before, I'm going to have other public officials come and speak to you all. Um, and that includes retirees and actors. Okay, so next on our agenda is our um, EEO, EEOC, uh, EEO lawyer, get to Kirkland. Um, for just to give some of you an update, we, um, when I first became the president, I did an assessment of our salaries and it was sad what I saw. Um, so I've been, it's a thorn in our hip why our salaries are not in parity with other probation departments and other law enforcement agencies. So I sought out Ms. Office, uh, Ms. Kirkland to um, represent us for EEO case and which you guys know what we have going on. So she's going to give you an update like she did last time on where we're at and where we're going. You ready, Yetta? Yep, I'm here. Right. Okay. okay. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you again. Uh, just giving a check in on where we are. So if you, as, as Katrina had said, you know, um, if you'll recall about a year and a half ago, we went through each of the boroughs. We did a, a pretty thorough um, uh, process of interviewing people. We held different uh, meetings and workshops, face-to-faces and kind of got some anecdotal stories to corroborate with the statistical information. 
Um, and basically, you know, the, the titles that we're talking about in UPOA are predominantly of color and they're predominantly female. The discriminatory impact of that, the adverse impact in terms of pay, impacts everyone. Doesn't matter if you're male, female, black, white. It, 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 is, a, it is a suppressed uh, salary that the, that the titles experience and that has an adverse impact on everybody. Um, and so we filed a complaint uh, with the EEOC. It took quite a while for them to process the complaint um, in large part, I think, because under the, I guess, still current administration for another 40, however many days, um, there wasn't a lot of focus on EEOC complaints and um, resources were not as dedicated to pursuing the types of class claims with discrimination that we were interested in. Um, so we uh, spoke to your leadership and we kind of went back and forth. Do we want to wait in EEOC and see if they were going to complete the investigation there? Or do we want to see if we could get a right to sue to move forward into federal court to have our day uh, in court? So we decided uh, we didn't want to keep waiting. We weren't sure how long we were going to have to wait. We put a line in the sand at the end of the year um, and we requested a right to sue letter. We received that. Um, I want to say two months ago, approximately two months ago, um, and we are planning to file uh, in early January in federal court in the Southern District of New York, a class action lawsuit uh, on behalf of the United Probation Officers Association. Um, what we are doing when working with your leadership to identify um, representative plaintiffs, uh, and that means individuals, members who are willing to be the face of the litigation. So we'll select, we're gonna go through a process. We have been engaged in that process where hopefully we'll select somewhere between two to eight representative plaintiffs that we think typifies the claims that we see with regards to UPOA members. So part of that is as we compare apples to apples, uh, similarly situated titles who, that, that are predominantly white and or predominantly male, when you look at what the job description is, what the job responsibilities are, and you match that up to the work that you do, uh, same or similar type of work, significant difference in pay. Um, and also people who come into the titles are promised an upward motion in terms of what their salary can become. But most of you hover uh, on, in the lowest thresholds of what the title offers. So while there may be a larger range of what you're supposed to kind of move up over the course of the time that you've been working, um, that doesn't actually happen. And in fact, one of the positions, the, um, what is it, Katrina, senior supervisor, senior probation officer. We have an asterisk on that, but it's not being used. Only right. last time we had a senior. Uh, we, right. So one of the higher positions has been completely kind of eliminated even though technically as part of the collective bargaining agreement that is supposed to be one of the rungs um, for UPOA. So um, we, we're looking for people who are willing to serve in that capacity. We're going through a process to review the people that we've interviewed so far um, when, when we did our focus groups speaking with uh, your president. We'll make that decision in the next week or so and we're hoping to start circulating drafts of complaints um, by not this week, but next week. So soon. And, and, and we want to file in early January, which, which will be soon. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Yenna, for the update. So I'm going, to, I'm going to sit with the executive board and we're going to figure out who those individuals will be. I'm going to try to um, get representation throughout the five boroughs. I believe you even asked for a retiree or two that we can look at to put. So retirees, we're going to be looking to have some retirees to come testify. How far back can you go, Yetta? Will you be able to go? You're going to try to go back. Um, well, we're going to bring a claim of continuing violations. It's a basis that allows us to go back as early as the problem occurred. Normally in uh, litigation for under Title VII or under some of the state or local laws, you can only go back three or potentially six years, depending on the types of claims. We're, in our complaint, we're going to go back from even further um, because John Augustus, we're John Augustus, John Augustus, the father of probation. What's that? John Augustus is the father of probation. So you got to go back to the 1800s. <laughs> I think one of the arguments we're making is that when the position was predominantly white and predominantly male, you know, you adjusted for inflation, but people were making a fair wage, a living wage 
it's interesting, you know, Eric Adams talked about this kind of um, continuing problems with cycles of poverty. It's also, you know, when we when we pay our workers less than what they're employed and when sometimes it can end up being almost close to minimum wage, it's a lot of those problems. And we, you know, we're looking for people who can speak eloquently about, you know, I had to borrow from my pension just to put food on my table. I didn't get to take Hello. my child on the Hello. trip to Disney to uh, celebrate uh, their graduation. Uh, your kid doesn't come and go. Your kid graduates from high school once in their life. And so, you know, you miss these really important opportunities and, and, and you shouldn't be. Um, so, so yeah, so we're looking, we're looking to go back to when that problem happened when you see a change in demographics you also see a change in the value of the title of value of the positions and then the commensurate uh, pay for that um so 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 that's what we'll start out with we'll, there'll be some back and forth we can talk more once we start to get to that stage i think next month we'll talk more about kind of what to expect in the arc of the litigation but um but we're, we're getting there and it's it's an exciting time and, and and hopefully we'll be filing in the next several weeks and we had some people that met with, with yet to, at the beginning of all this, we had a, a focus group. So we could look to some of them that if some of you guys want to circle back with me, you're interested, we can look at some of them. I think she identified some individuals that sat in the focus group with her as well. So yet I want to thank you. Yep. I wish you a happy first birth, I mean, Christmas for the baby. And you all um, happy, I see you in 20, no, I spoke to you Wednesday. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going nowhere yet. All right, talk to you later. a lot of work before then. Okay. okay. Thank you all. Good night. So next up is ASO. Um, the retirees didn't have the privilege of um, seeing the presentation for ASO. ASO is administrative services only. Um, I believe we sent you out some information about ASO. We now update, they, they was doing the dental only. So now what we've done, we've adopted, adopted their system. And remember we was doing an overhaul or did a complete overhaul. So with the ASO system now, you, have, you will now have the ability to look at your accounts and your balances as far as optical and all, and which I'm not going to get into which Alan and Simone will talk more about. They're going to, um, so you'll be able to see your, the balances on your accounts and you'll be able to scan information up into the, into the, your own e-folder, so to speak. So without, I'm going to um, let Alan and Simone talk about that and you can take it from here, Alan, Simone. Well, first, thank you for adopting me. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. What happened? That's my email. Okay. The um, oh, that's yeah, the other. Uh, do, uh, do you have that other uh, document? The uh, let's see which one is that? It's a page. Oh, page here. Okay. Yes. Okay, so we have a website uh, that you'll be able to, that you can access um, on the website. If we go to, um, you have two ways of looking up information. Uh, the easiest way is there's a uh, quick, uh, first, there's a quick search button. So you can just go and do a, a quick, um, a, do a quick search. So you could find a participating dentist and you click on, uh, first you have to click on the down arrow by find a participating dentist and you look for United Probation Officers Association. Okay. And Thank then you for click search. Can you give me a, a quick blurb of what you said so I could put in a newsletter and make sure I get it right? Yeah, yeah so if you okay, scroll thanks. down and then you click uh, on find the group and you find the probation, United Probation Officers and then you can find the provider or you can also do a quick search for forms. If you want to get more personal information, you go down to the uh, next screen and you can log on as a, uh, as a member. When you first log on, you'll, uh, you have to log on using your social security number and a, and a zip code, or alternatively, you can create a profile. And so then by logging in as a member, you'll be able to look up information that specifically pertains to yourself. Uh, so if you scroll down to the next uh, slide. And then there are instructions on how to uh, uh, set up uh, to set up an account. And then the next slide. 
And then step two is you enter in information about yourself and, um, and you could set up security questions. And then uh, also what we have is to set up is what's called two factor verification, which is very important. You would get a, uh, not only will you have your username and password, but you also receive a, either an email or a, or a text message with um, a PIN number that uh, as an added security level uh, before you're able to log into your account. And then, um, so you create the, uh, uh, remind this. Yeah, so when, like, after you log in as a username, you could, you know, we just remind you to create a user profile for that added security. And then you can update your uh, profile information. And then, uh, so then you can review your information on your, on the, uh, on the website and you can update it. So like you'll see a button where it says uh, two factor sign in by email or two factor sign in by text and you'll see your information. And then also you can print an ID card. Not that you need a member ID card, but sometimes it's nice to have something with you when you go to a participating dentist. So if you scroll down to the next one. And this is a sample of what the, uh, uh, what would print out. You could print that out on your computer. And then if you wanna scroll down next. And yeah. then, oh, and then also you can review your, your uh, claims. Um, you could review by um, either by date of service or by family member or a type of uh, benefit. So you have various ways of finding out your claims. And then you can also, so then you can also view your explanation of benefit voucher. An explanation benefit voucher is the voucher that you get that is part of the uh, check. It shows like what the services were, or if you use, or if you did not receive a check, if the check went to the provider, this is what you would get. And it's always a good idea to review the uh, when you get an explanation of benefits voucher. It's always a good idea to review it this way to make sure that um, the services being submitted on your behalf are accurate and that the claim was. Um, appropriate. And here's how to find the participating dentist. You can look up by, um, uh, by all providers or specialty, like a general practitioner, a periodontist, an endodontist, and various specialties. And then also you could look uh, for a provider based on a kilometer to one mile, three miles, or expand, or expand out. And then uh, information about the uh, dentist will pop up in the locations. And then we also have some, uh, uh, as we develop profiles, people submit uh, surveys, uh, you'll see the uh, survey responses. And also on our website, um, you can see uh, information about, uh, you could uh, download a benefit booklet and dental plan information and various forms. And let's see if we can And also you'll be able to, now it's never a good idea to email any information uh, that might have personal information, but through our website, uh, you can upload a document since it's a secure site. So you can upload uh, documents uh, to our website. And um, for some benefits, you'll be able to see like what, what patient is, like let's say for optical, like you, sometimes you don't know, am I still, am I eligible for the benefit this year? So on our site, you'll be able to see 
that who has and who has not yet used the optical benefit. And for the various other benefits, you'll see how much was used for, for other benefits. And, uh, and so that's an overall summary of the website and, and, we're, and we're making changes uh, as we get feedback to try and make it a more user-friendly experience and, um, and also a more user-friendly experience on, the, on your phone, like an app. And, and I think uh, that covers everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so this, this will be available on our website, which we're updating. And I want to just say before we have our next speaker that we're in the process of redoing the benefits books. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a benefit book for the retiree and a benefit book for the active. And we'll do a big mailing at one shot. And then at some point, it's gonna all be on the website. And the vision is to, when you go to the website, you'll be able to click on, like, let's say in the table of contents, you'll be able to click our vision. It's to take, let's say you have a table of contents optical and you'll click on optical and instead of going to the whole booklet, you'll click on optical. This is what Marcy's vision is now you'll click on optical and you'll go right into the page of optical. So just bear with us if you don't um, see the on the website, we took it down and we're hoping to be able to do the mailing along these mailings by January. So just bear with us. Anything you need to know, you can call the union office at 212-226-1069. Also, you have any comments in addition to the chat room, you can also reach out to us at, we have a, um, a, 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 a um, email where you can reach out to the union at unitedprobation.com to ask any questions and our PR team monitor that and they refer the questions to me and Charlene and we'll try to answer them to the best of our abilities. Whatever we don't know, we'll do the homework to find out what we can to answer your questions. So that's for everybody, unitedprobation.com. The other thing is for active and, you know, I'm sorry, United Probation, I made a mistake, unitedprobation at gmail.com, forgive me, I'm sorry. UnitedProbation at gmail.com. If you have any comments you want to make, observations, share information, contact us on UnitedProbation at gmail.com. And everybody knows I always make myself readily available to everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm here for everybody. I'm never, I'm 24 7, so I'm available, active and retired. And also for retirees, you can send active and retired, send your emails to UnitedProbation at gmail.com. If you want to get the newsletters or be in, up, kept up to date about any information that we want to, um, that you want to know about, okay? So now what I'm going to do is I am going to now introduce our next, next and final speaker. But don't get off um, you all because I have some housekeeping stuff to share with you. Mr. Hank, our um, lobbyist, is going to talk to us about what the status is with the early retirement um, package that they've been talking about offering to try to offer also offset the layoffs. Hank, where you go? Is he there? Hello? Oh, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. I did. Okay. Thank you. Um, we, I've been working on the, um, on the early retirement uh, piece of legislation for at least six months with Anthony Wells and the Teamsters and everybody else who I represent and work with. Um, do I think it's going to get done? I'm not sure. I mean, there's an awful lot of us on working on it. We've been working on it for months. You know, um, do I think that the city uh, will want it? I'm not sure. I mean, the the you know, the, look. There's some hard facts. I don't like to make excuses. There, I've been at this a long time, and there's some very hard facts. And I told one of the, the and I think uh, when I first uh, came to work for uh, for Katrina, I told her what I thought was going to happen a year and a half down the road, and I it was exactly on the mark. Um, that they're, it, it's going to be worse than people think and that the real number is not what the mayor is saying. It's much worse. And ditto in the state that has the state issue is about Medicaid and the city issue is about idiocy. Um, and there was uh, COVID just exacerbated in a situation that was unnecessary. The mayor's wasting of literally tens of billions of dollars. Um, the, the failure to come up with a comprehensive plan for homelessness, which he had six and a half years to do pre-COVID. 
the uh, it's just extraordinary. So I don't know that we're going to get this done. I think the legislature would want it to get it done uh, for a host of reasons, which is the fact is that primarily black women are impacted by this thing more so than anybody else if we get it done. And uh, I don't I don't know why anybody who wants to uh, wants to see serious change in New York City would consider not aiding African American women who are going to suffer the brunt of layoffs. It's just the facts of life. I, I was here the last time this happened in 75, and it, it was not pretty or pleasant for people to go and try cash checks at local banks and, and the, with the city of New York imprinted on the front of them be told to go away. Or when, uh, when peace officers and police officers had to surrender their weapons, their ID cards, and their shields, it was not a pleasant moment. Do I think that's going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. I think depending upon the federal government for bailout is nonsense. They're not going to give you the money that you need. I mean, if you need $35 billion, I'm just trying to imagine what president in his right mind or what, what the leader of the Senate, Democrat or Republican, would write a check for $35 billion to the state of New York and then expect that you could get reelected in farm country and see such a need. I just don't think that's realistic. What I do think is we'll get something. Question is, will it be what we really need? What we need is the bill that a lot of us, uh, you know, talked about with the with members of the MLC, which Katrina knows about certainly, um, and I've been, you know, beating everybody up to get. The other in intervening variable is that there's a change in leadership in some of these committees in the in the state assembly. We don't know who's going to be in those slots yet. I'm hoping that we get um, an African American woman running the codes committee, which will make it easy to get some of the structural things that that probation officers need with respect to mandatory uh, mandatory numbers, uh, workloads, authority under certain circumstances, caseloads, and on and on and on and on. And a greater, greater um, uh, relationship between the work, what you do, and what you're paid compared to what local departments are doing similar work are paid. But we need legislation to get that done. Um, and I think that it'll depend on who we get in the codes committee chairmanship. Chairwomanship, I think it'll be a black woman. I hope it is. I spoke to somebody last week, but uh, on the other stuff, I don't have any good answers. I really don't. And if I tried to give you a tap dance, I'd lie. But I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I just, it's not, I don't have any good answers because there's nothing good to say about any of it. I've been at this and I've been at this with, look, with, with 237 Teamsters, uh, Anthony Wells uh, at 371 and everybody else for a long, long time. And I'm, I've been pretty good at doing hat tricks, but there's no hat trick here because there's nothing to work with. If we get that bill done, if all of us, all of us lobbyists have been working on that bill um, to get uh, to get uh, to, to defer layoffs by uh, getting early retirements, it will be a major victory for everybody. But as to enhancing benefits at the present moment, I don't want to say no, but I think it'd be very tough, very tough. Just why? It's not that the employer wants to screw us out of money, which is what they normally try to do. The problem is they don't have any money. This, this is not a question of, well, they're really hiding it. You know, we know that he lied. The mayor, as usual, lied um, a couple months back. We found $3 billion because, uh, we, have, you know, the unions have great people working for them, and they found $3 billion bucks that he was hiding. Okay, that's one shot. We don't know what else he's done. There's nothing there. I would be very surprised at the present moment to see the city get through with this present cash flow unless something unusual happens. Um, probably no later than April, if, when the state strikes its budget in April. I'll get some relief then, but unless we have a major aid package and get that deferred, um, def get, the, uh, get the early retirements passed, it's gonna be quite an interesting thing and terrible for some people to see. And I think if I told you anything differently, I'd be lying. I mean, I'm the idiot that predicted we'd be the place where we are. I told that to the Teamsters Union before I came to work for, for, uh, for you all. I said what was going to be, and I was pretty right. Sadly, I've been right for about this stuff for most of the last 40 years. That's all I have to say. I'm very depressed by the whole thing. Thank you, Hank. So I want to, and, and that's what we're about, about keeping it real. And we never, never have I, since I've been a union rep, have we ever sold you guys anything but pipe drinks? No, we don't sell pipe drinks, and we're not going to, we didn't do it in the past, and we're not going to do it now. Well, so, and I think we get, if we get a new codes committee chair, I, yeah. we went, when, when I first came to work, I took, uh, Katrina to see uh, with, with other with other with other uh, people to see uh, the then chair of the codes committee Joe Lentil, right, who right. has unfortunately been defeated. Now, 
in his bid for election. I don't see how Democratic Socialist DSA people are going to go out of their way to get us what we need in the probation side, even though it's we can we can theoretically position probation personnel as uh, as the best diversion a person best diversion people that we have. But I can see a real move to entirely civilianize criminal justice positions, which is to me much more dangerous than even the present financial situation, because that would be that and I don't and if anybody thinks that's not beyond the realm of possibility with the crazy people running for office and being elected, you're wrong. I mean, it's just I, I think we really have to see what happens in January on that retirement bill. We get the early retirement bill or some fashion thereof, we'll be able to do other things. But I think that is the first order of business. Would I like to see you get um, the structural changes that we've talked about with the new codes committee chair? If it's who I think it is, we'll have a shot. You know, your leadership will go in the room. We'll try to get some stuff into, into statute, at least get it written, and hopefully the speaker will approve it. it comes out of the chair, it will be. But the, and so that's my plan. First is the retirement bill. Second is structural uh, structural benefits in the in the nature of what the job is and how, how you are treated in relationship to other departments in the area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, wish I, I wish I could smile. I'm not smiling about this. You know what, hey, uh, we, we got, you got to give it to us the way it is. That's well, that's the truth. I mean, if somebody tells you something different and they, they're better at telling a story than I am, then you should get and hire them. But the we story I'm telling you. Operate. We don't operate. In but I know, that, I know you're very loyal people, but the story I'm telling you is unfortunate. I don't like these kinds of stories. I wish I had a better story to tell. But you know what? I don't want you to sell us a pipe dream either. There are no me. pipe dreams here. If, look, if I can knock down the door to get to the other side, I'll do that in 30 seconds. Oh, they, the problem they, is I don't know what the door is to knock down right now. And right. anybody who does is telling a lie. Right, so transparency, keeping it real, giving us the opportunity to make our own decisions because people have been waiting to, on this early retirement as far as leaving and stuff like that. And Do I think okay. we got a shot. I think it's I think it's 50 50. OK, that's and I think that's better. We got why? Because I don't believe that this particular legislative grouping of people want to take the weight of having to lay off X number of African-American women and going back to their communities and hearing about it for the rest of their lives and maybe getting knocked out of office because we, because that's but, what's and, 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 that's, and that's why we're doing things on the union end, like Harry said earlier, to try to prevent that and do some deferment. Let them see your black faces and remember, okay? Right. That okay. way they won't forget. When they see a face, they don't forget. You get a new mayor too, and then I'll shut up. You get Adams, he's got a, a you know, we spoke to him, you and I spoke to him before about this. He's got a plan to get all criminal justice and one criminal justice agencies or related agencies in one place, where the NYPD does not enjoy the stature it presently does at the at the expense of every other, everybody else, which might not be a bad thing, but you need Adams in office in order to do that. Do I think he gets there? I think it's 50-50. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, President. Have a good holiday. See you soon. I'm around, I'm not going to. I'll talk to you tomorrow, probably. You will, you always do. You know I am, I don't go nowhere. You know, I know that, I'll see you later. <laughs> you stuck with me, have a good one. All right, so with that said, I'm going to close, I'm getting ready to come to an end, but I want to do some housekeeping. Um, so I told you about, make sure you contact unitedprobation at gmail.com for your emails. Um, the new booklets is coming out by January. Um, for the active, the we got in our last contract, we got a, a uniform allowance of $250. You got your first payment last year. Somebody told me they bought AirPods for their kids. That's not funny. That's not at all. You guys been wanting to be considered. You had the borough president. You had the governor. Put you on the screen. Acknowledge you as first responders. What is that? Law enforcement, right? You've been wanting uniforms prior to me. We've been working on uniforms. We finally getting uniforms going. You got a uniform allowance, two hundred fifty dollars. It will be paid on December eleventh. Yes, this Friday, December eleventh. Spread the word. I would like for you all active to go buy a shirt, go to the website on the department's internet and go buy a shirt, a jacket, a belt, buy something with your $250. I didn't say spend the whole $250, but spend 35 and then you can take the rest and go buy some iPods for your kids. But I really would like to see you guys buy a shirt because we're trying to move in the direction that you all been asking to move into. Now, if I'm wrong for trying to get us there, tell me I'll stop and we'll go back to TDB. You understand? But the whole objective here is to be recognized as law enforcement, to conduct ourselves as such. Some people don't want to wear them all the time. I didn't say wear them all the time. Because of COVID, you're coming to the office 
once, twice, whatever. Wear it when you're coming to the office. How about that? Do like law, other law enforcement do. When you come to work, you take your shirt off or you put a jacket over it. But you know what? Buy a, sh a shirt, buy some pants. The department has a whole link. And what I'm going to do is in the newsletter, I'm going to add, I'm going to include that link into the into the newsletter and we'll have it on Tangent to put up on the website. So you can go shopping at your leisure to go buy a uniform, some type of uniform. And what other law enforcement or people do, they buy their uniforms and they buy, and after a while they buy maybe five shirts, they buy a pair of pants, and then they keep it to the rest until they retire. If they gain some weight, okay, then you have to buy another shirt or they pass it on. But the point I'm trying to make is when I start going in, back into the offices after COVID, I want to know who my members are. I want to know who is the officer and who is the client. Because right now, sometimes I walk into the office, I don't know who, who is no more. You understand? We used to, old school, we used to wear our shields either around our neck. Where's my shirt? We used to wear our shields around our neck or we wore them open. We know who we, we didn't have uniforms, but we knew who they was. I go into the office locations now, I don't know who, who is no more. So for our own, to be distinguished for our own safety, for a lot of reasons, I ask that come on December 11th, this Friday, you're going to have some extra money in your check. It's going to be included with your check. It's not going to be a separate check like last year. Go buy a shirt. Go buy something. Okay, that's the end of that. I'm, I'm not going to say it no more. The, um, the other thing is um, when it comes to claims, when you upload your claims into the system, try not to bunch them, make sure they're not crooked. Don't overlap the receipts with the um with the forms. Charlene, real quick, won't you tell them what you want when you see a, a claim? Yes, you, Charlene. <laughs> this is Charlene, who's behind the scene. Everybody calls. Hi. And asks. Charlene is the best one, and Joanne can tell you what they want to see. We have Joanne, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. That she's gonna tell you what you want to see, Joanne. I mean, Charlene, when you see when you do. Well, um, I would say mostly with copays especially a copays, we have to have, we can't just have like a cash register receipt. We have to have like an itemized statement. So we have to have data service, um, patient name, and then the description of charge, like the reason for charge. And all claims have to have a claim form. They have to be signed with addresses, phone numbers, emails, everything. Okay, so make sure that your form, and the reason that we have to have the forms and receipts properly submitted because the claim can't get paid. We can't pay something if we don't have no proof of payment. Yeah, we, we have to know how to categorize the claim. And plus we have to also, we get audits. So we can't just randomly be, just be paying something because somebody sent us either, sometimes we get claims with no receipts or we don't understand it. So make sure your stuff is clear. And the medical form, which is, which is also an ASO website, because you can't get the forms off our website now. So ASO, right, Alan has our forms up on your website. No, they can get them off our website. They can get off the website, Tim? Yeah, upoa.com. Oh, okay. So they can get off yeah, yeah. both ASO and upoa.com. Your forms in the medical form clearly categorizes what those are, yeah. um, benefits are. We have to include the school. Alan, did you in school, it, include education? Yes. So now yes, education, education is $250 per year. Two year, 250 per year. So we got a couple of people that that's good. They went back to school. They got good grades. They did very good. They ate students. I'm gonna say something. Like so I'm proud of y'all. So now you can put your education um, for active. You can put in um, the claims for your um, your your 250 dollars because it's now up on the um, on the system. So that's that. Now um, the ASO the newsletter is coming out soon. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have all the presenters give us a, a summary of what they just spoke about, and we'll incorporate that into the um website. Anything else I need to include? Um, any questions, like I said, refer them to the um, unitedprobation at gmail.com. And for the active, I want to, um, what we did was executive board, at, let me just tell you, we was going to have a holiday, we was going to have a holiday event to include the active and retirees, which would have been the health and wellness. Two years ago, we had a regular holiday party that was for the active only, but this year we was going to have something on the 19th for the active and retirees, a health and wellness where I was going to coordinate with ASO.net. Because of COVID, we couldn't have it. And I'm not going to risk anybody's life. So um, we have, um, we're looking maybe for that to be in 2022. Let's see how things play out. And we'll have a health and wellness for the active and retiree. We can all come together. But we're going to do things safely and smartly, OK? If it can't be 2022, it'll be 2023. As long as I'm in position, we're going to get, we all going to come together again to celebrate ourselves, okay? 
but for the active, what we did was executive board, because we could not have your local parties and we couldn't have a big party, we bought some, we got you guys some some giveaways that we've dropped off and some of your executive board. Um, unfortunately, we can't give it to the retirees because they don't pay dues. So what we did was we have giveaways for the active that's being distributed as I speak. Um, the keychains with our, our shield and it says UPA, UPOA on it. So make sure you contact your executive board and all your supervisors because all the supervisors have your packages to pick up your, um, your giveaways. And with that said, I think we, oh, eyeglasses. The eyeglass for active and retired, the eyeglass, eyeglass period ends this December. So if you haven't gotten eyeglasses for the two years, right, Charlene, for the 2019, what was it? The, uh, the two year period right now is 2019 to 2020. And then the new two-year period is January first, twenty twenty-one. All of January, all of all of twenty twenty-one, and then all of twenty twenty-two. So, if you didn't get so glasses, if, you know, if anyone, yeah, if you still have money left over, you want to use it by the end of this month. Now. Yeah. And the beauty of your ASO virtual e-folder is that you can go to your e-folder and see your eligibility as far as your glass glass mm -hmm. balances, or if you ever use them at all. Always, but still, we're not going to leave you to defend for yourself. You can still call Charlene and Joanne yeah, I still to find out what your balances are. Now, I, I keep talking about Joanne Palmer. Joanne Palmer is a retired probate, supervising probation officer. And she, along with Elaine Brooklyn Sutton and Yvonne Hernandez and um, William Coachman and Mark, Mark Fleischer and Linda Addison and... Um, it, Barbara Luck, and if I forgot somebody, please tell me. Joanne, jumping at any minute, um, got together and um, started a um, retiree association. We're trying to get it started. Um, they're working on some things, when, and they want to make sure that the retirees are always included in everything possible. One day, we want to do something. I remember years ago, we used to have a luncheon for the retirees, and maybe one day we'll be able to do strictly a luncheon for the retirees, you know. They'll talk to you more about that. Um, they'll have sell tickets or whatever, however they're going to do it. But they're still a work in progress. So, Joanne, real quick before we close out, you want to talk to your retirees and let them know real quick. We're going to, with your vision, real quick, because we got to go. Joe, unblock, unlock yourself. Unblock yourself. Unmute yourself, Joe. Push the, the microphone, Joanne. Click the button over there, Joanne. See the button? Can you unmute, Joanne? Yeah, I'm trying to do that now. Oh, and Tange is also on the Retiree Association, and she does all our, um, she facilitates all our meetings. Thank you, Tange, for all you do for us. Joanne, we can't hear you, Joe. I asked to unmute her. Can, Can you, you unmute her? Where is she? I don't see her. I see her right there. <laughs> oh, Joanne, you're right there. Wait, just unmute the button. You're talking. Oh, Joanne, on your bottom left. Bottom, <laughs> bottom left. Like, oh. Bottom left? It's that, yeah, you'll see like a microphone. You see the microphone? Yeah. Yvonne. 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 Hernandez. Okay, Elaine. I'm Jump. here. Hi. Jump Hi, everybody. So, Elaine, Yvonne, Elaine, and Joan. Yvonne, tell them what y'all been doing. We've been um, conducting monthly meetings through Zoom also, our next meeting is Wednesday. And uh, we discussed uh, several things. We discussed um, the constitution. We're making up the constitution now for the retirees, which is in, we're doing it now, it's pending. So it's almost just about done. And we, ha we also talked about- in. You're not frozen because I'm looking at you. You're not hearing me? So no. we yeah, yeah. So we, you know, we just started about a year ago, over a year ago. We're gonna try to make it uh, do stuff. You know, with COVID, it's a little difficult. We used to meet in person. Now we have Zoom meetings monthly, and we're doing a great job. The, the people that are involved in the committee, they're really good people with seasoned, you know, uh, retirees. We've been retired. Some of us are newly retired, like myself, over a year now. And um, it keeps me busy doing this um, being, a, I'm the vice president of the Retirement Association. So it keeps us busy, right Elaine? 
Absolutely. It was <laughs> very busy. Yeah. Yeah. We want to do some other activities with the retirees, but you know, we have, we're yeah, working we can't on that. Do it now. Not we now. Miss you. No. We miss you in Brooklyn, Yvonne. We miss you in Brooklyn Family Court. Oh, hi, James. How are you? I miss Brooklyn too. <laughs> but there's nothing like being retired. I guess. <laughs> We're waiting for you, James. Yes. There's nothing Three like it. You don't see us stressed out, right? We don't have bags under our eyes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. It's a good thing. Joanne is great, a great uh, president and Katrina is supportive, very supportive. The whole committee, William Coachman, Linda, Barbara Lott, Anna Ponte. Yeah. It's a good group, Mark also. Be with you guys in three years. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> the more the merrier. Yes. Yeah. So we want to do activities, but we have to wait for the COVID to be over. We have activities for the retirees, which is going to be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Yvonne. So what, yeah. I, what I want to say is that we have a nice representation of the retirees. And the retirees, if you want to give feedback on what you want to see for yourselves, certain things we can't do because, um, like I said, what we do for active, we can't do for retirees because you guys don't pay dues anymore, which is a good thing. So, but like I said, anything you want to see of the Retirees Association, um, I'll put Joanne's contact information up there. Um, once again, utilize the United Probation at gmail.com to give input on it. I think it's a good thing to keep you guys included. Before the COVID, the, the retirees was coming and doing the mailings for us, and that got you guys out the information. Now Joanne comes in and Coachman comes in and did this last mailing for you guys. So we're going to try to keep you guys included as, as much in the mix as possible. Because like I said in the beginning, you guys paved, paved the way for us. And I want to keep you guys in the loop. Um, I'm available to you at, at all times by number. I'll put it up on um, in the in the e-news and on the website. And the 212-2, what's the number? 274-9950. That number is still the same. So I'm going to, I think I covered everything. If I didn't, it will be in the e-news. You guys are all being, um, it, um, have the privilege of, um, having access to the e-news. Um, I want to tell everybody have a happy holiday. This was wonderful. And in a couple of years, we'll all be getting down to boogieing somewhere. I don't know where yet. And um, I love you all and take care. All right. Wait a minute, care. wait a right. minute, wait, wait. We got Shimkin. I'm voice, wait, wait. Yeah, hey, Mr. Shimkin. Well, Mr. Unmute yourself, sir. I can't, unmute, unmute Mr. Shimkin. Rose, Mr. Shimkin. Shimkin used to work with us in the union office. He's try to unmute the, unmute yourself. Go down there. Your Go bottom down. left. Bottom left. We can't hear. Can't, you can't unmute it. I'm trying. It's been eight months since we've read lips. You gotta. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't unmute him. I can mute him, but I can't unmute yeah, him. Yeah, I can't unmute him either. I don't know why. You can't unmute you him. Have, you have to press his own button. You gotta push your own button, sir. Lou, Look bottom left, microphone. bottom left, unmute. Unmute, bottom left. You're okay. gonna see, you're gonna see a microphone. Call Rose. Where's Rose? Where's Rose? Tell Rose to help. Rose, we don't we won't look at you. Just on the bottom left. See there on the bottom left, you're gonna see a microphone with a little arrow. It, it's like crossing the uh, you see the it's got microphone. a slash over it. It's got a slash over it. It has a slash over it. It's a microphone in the corner. Yeah, click unmute. Unmute, just click it, the microphone. Click the microphone. That's so cute. You see the microphone? All right, we're gonna give you all some training too. We're gonna do training. All right, Katrina, while while they're trying to do that, I had a couple of Oh, he of did it, he got it, he got it. Oh, there you go. Okay, am I back? <gasps> yeah, you're back. back? You're okay, I want you to know, first of all, I didn't change my name from Lou to Rose. This happens to be my wife's tablet. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's New Rose uh -huh. uh, I was very impressed with this meeting. I loved it. I think that it shows me that you're all active. You're involved. That's a wonderful thing. So time marches on. Okay. Yeah. I retired in 1992. Uh, I, wow. a couple of things I want to say. Number one, uh, 
our president said something very early at this meeting that some of the things that are going to be discussed maybe are not going to be interesting for retirees. Well, let me tell you, everything I heard and watched, I found very interesting. I'm part of this family. And no matter how long I live, I, I admire my family, not only my immediate blood family, but you all, because I've spent a lot of time in the probation department. Uh, I started in the probation department in 1964. Wow. I remember, wow. I remember working, God bless you. working with a supervisor who told me an anecdote where he was part of the union, had a different name then, and he went to see the mayor who happened to be Fiorello LaGuardia because they wanted to petition the mayor to get an increase in salary. And they used as an argument that the uh, people who worked for the Department of Sanitation were not college graduates and they were making more money than we did. Mm -hmm. and, and Mayor LaGuardia responded by saying, <laughs> well, I gotta have the garbage picked up. I don't give a damn about what you guys pick up. So that's part of the problem with probation. It's been a built-in problem because nobody really knows, or I should say very few people really know what probation is or what we do. That's right. One of the problems True. I had as a young probation officer, yeah, Bronx, this was in the early 60s, when if you did a pre-sentence report, one of the things you were required to do was to personally interview the arresting officer. That was a problem because you found they were very hostile to us. They assumed if it's probation that's calling, you must be in favor of the guy who they arrested. I wish I had a dollar every time I tried to convince them that we're not for the defendant nor against the defendant. We had to put a report together and they made the assumption like so many people do that if probation is, is involved, that means the defendant is getting a break. They didn't know that a, a, a large percentage of the people who were uh, a report was done ended up being sentenced to state prison, okay? Or I used to get people who would say, oh, you work for probation. How is it working for those kids, working with these kids? I never worked with kids. I was in the adult services. So people in every form of life make incorrect generalizations about what people are about or what yeah. they do or what their role is. So we were like a mixed bag. And I think that there was a plus and a minus in combining law enforcement together with social work. I don't know about anybody else, but for me, it was easier to, it was more clear cut to concentrate on the law enforcement aspect because it was very clear, it was cut and dry, you know, it was a cop out. Mm -hmm. But we were also expected to function as, as a social worker. So mm -hmm. that was a, a built in problem that I think we're still suffering mm -hmm. from as a profession. Okay. But again, I wanna say, I admire all of you who spoke. You, you, make, you made me feel much younger there are people who are involved, and I, I, I think that's great. Thank you. I look forward to attending other uh, mo more meetings. Yes. More meetings. We, I, I just hope they're not all Zoom. But no, <laughs> no, no, no. But what I want to say, thank you for, for giving, sharing with us, because he's also working in the union office. That's why he let him speak. But I'm going to wrap it up. So what I want to say to y'all, John Rand is here. Yeah. She can speak now. Okay. Joe. Hello, everyone. Um, I was frozen. I had to get back in, but I want to thank you, Yvonne and Elaine and whomever is on my committee that's present. I want to thank you all, but I especially thank Yvonne because you summed it up. And I appreciate being back as a retiree and, and in my capacity. Um, I will try to make sure that I communicate with the um with the retirees so we can come together and um, 
maybe improve our benefit. Our benefit. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm go I'm going I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to tell you once again. Thank you, everybody. But I want you to understand that when Mr. Simpkin was talking about the hustle has linked has been in existence from back in the day, and the hustle still goes on. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to try to change that story. Um, and we and and what makes us unique is that we are law enforcement that uses the tools, the tools that we use to change the lives of others. It's not that we're social workers. But those are the tools that makes our jobs unique because we have to use those tools, whatever, whatever tools the administration gives us to change somebody's life and to keep the community safe at large. That's our objective is to make a difference in somebody's life to keep the community safe. So whatever, and at the end of the day, whether it's adult court or family court, the objective is still the same that we might not change the lives of every person that comes to our doors, but if we change the lives of one, you all have done the job. You all have done a good job. You have all left a legacy in some way, in some form, and you can continue to leave legacies. And I speak to the young people that you have history. You are among history. A couple of weeks ago, I went to go see one of our oldest probation officer, Mr. Bryce, 101 years old. This man has all his faculties. Probation officers age very well, and we live a very long time because we're happy people and we give. And when you have the spirit of giving back, and paying forward, you continue to give many blessings. So I'm going to shut up because I'm gonna get emotional in a minute and I'm gonna tell you all, have a happy holiday again. I'll see you in a couple happy of holiday, months. Sweetie. All right, hopefully it will be, you can unmute because everybody's gonna say happy, <clears throat> bye. But I'm gonna click, I want everybody to get home safely. Don't talk to strangers and don't be drinking and driving. On your way. <laughs> okay. Wait, Katrina, any, any member that hasn't picked up PPE, how do they get it? From who? I uh, remember you were giving, oh! Yeah, remember you were giving out PPE? Tell them to call me. I've got to find out. All right. And, okay. and, and that's it. So, all right. Love you. I'll get home safe. Don't, don't all right. Me. All right. Bye bye. Nice all seeing right. you, everybody. Oh yes, thanks. Really Trina, you got to call a meeting. Call a meeting. Call a meeting. Meeting has come to an end. Time is 6 03. Very good. 